Hello everybody and welcome to the channel. I'm Dr. Tom Pepper and this is part two of my analysis of the debate from about a year ago between Stefan Molyneux and Vosch. I did a lot of setup and intro for this in part one, so to get the full picture you should go back and watch that video on my channel. That'll cover section one of the debate where they talked about uh, the source of wealth and there was a lot of argument, a lot of good back and forth and I've analysed a lot of that there. I thought Molyneux came out ahead there. The grades I gave him were 7 out of 10 for Molyneux and 5 out of 10 for Vosch. Vosch, I thought, did okay, but he had a few major pitfalls that held him back. This part will cover section two, which is nominally about exploitation, like that's the topic they're supposed to be debating, but it isn't really about that at all. It's really about whether or not Vosch is a hypocrite. And since that's the most interesting part of the debate, that's what I'll cover here. But more importantly, I'm going to look at whether it matters that Vosch is a hypocrite. I'll leave links to all the relevant videos down below, but Vosch has a follow-up to this video from about a month later, or this debate, I should say about a month later where he just writes off this hypocrite thing says it's not an argument and doesn't count and isn't important um so let's take a look and see if he's right so to start on those questions we really need to cover the debate question in hand which is what is exploitation Vosch answers that exploitation is usually when companies um obtain favorable conditions from their employees um, because they have all the power over them essentially uh, Molyneux doesn't really answer the question at all. I think this section covers about half an hour, 45 minutes, and it, it gets more interesting as it goes along. But Molyneux starts off very, very rocky here. I think out of the, the whole debate, argumentatively, this section is probably the weakest from either guy. He's just kind of speechifying. He makes some good points about education and its, its, um, its place in the field of work and that kind of thing, what it should be for, what it's actually used for. But there's really no argument. He's not tying the points all together in any interesting way. So I'd say this was a really weak start from Molyneux, and he doesn't directly answer the question at all. Since the end, section one was really quite heated. It is nice to see them getting on better. It's all quite amicable. Like, from that point of view, the debate is better conducted. But there's not a lot of argumentation or substance from either guy. One thing I do want to point out is that at a certain point, I'll leave the reference down here, uh, Vosch and Molyneux prove the point I made in section one, which is that they don't really disagree. There's a noticeable section where Vosch starts talking about particularly productive people, which, in, you know, it, it, it coheres pretty well with what Molyneux was saying in part one. And then like a few minutes later, Molyneux starts talking about how useful it has to have laborers doing all the work. So it's like, yeah, you, you both recognize that your answers to the question in section one were valid. They just didn't tell the whole story. So should include that in section one, but I'll point it out here. But then we get to the good stuff. Molyneux starts to press Vosch about how he runs his channel in a monopolistic way. So Vosch runs everything to do with his channel. He doesn't seem to employ anybody. He only contracts people out. And Vosch had been arguing for the success of co-ops. He seemed to be saying both that they were ethically the right thing to do when you sort of share the wealth among all the employees and also that they were more financially successful. Um, if he didn't make that point in the debate, I'm sure I've heard him make it somewhere elsewhere, right? So Vosch is fully behind co-ops, thinks they work better, and they're more ethical. So Molyneux starts to question why Vosch doesn't run his small business, essentially his YouTube channel, like a co-op. Instead, he, he runs it like any business would do in a monopolistic manner, where he has all the power and control. Uh, Vosch admits he uses editors on a contract basis, so they aren't employees. And he seems to think that that's like a get out for him, that he doesn't need to run his channel like a co-op because, hey, the, the people that do my editing, they're not employees. They're just uh, independent contractors or whatever. Vosch is getting quite noticeably flustered at this point. I mean, he got angry at points in section one, but he's like, that defense doesn't make any sense. Like it, he's saying, well, I don't have to run my channel like a co-op because my contract because the people who do my editing are contractors not employees but i think molly briefly makes a point at least you know well why why not make them employees and pay them more like why not share more of the wealth of course as, as alluded several times it challenges very well financially and he talks about how he only gives his editors a couple of hundred bucks and it's like well why not employ them full-time give them more work to do because frankly i'm not sure what work editors do on Vosch's channel nothing, nothing he makes seems to be edited employ them full-time, give them full benefits, healthcare, work security, right? Because as it is, you know, a month might go by where they get no work from Borsch, or they might get three contracts in a week. So why not employ them, set out the terms? Isn't that a lot fairer? Isn't that what Borsch wants to see? And 
wouldn't his definition of exploitation apply to him since he's using his power, right? They need him and he doesn't need them because he can find another editor. He's using that to get favorable conditions, which is not having to pay them a regular wage, not having to give them a chunk of his apparently large proceedings and that kind of thing. So isn't he just acting like sort of capitalist uh, overlord that he always acts like he despises? Vorsch starts to compare his editors to guys that water plants in a business or guys that deliver fast food takeouts to people who work for a business, i.e. like, oh, they're not actually part of my organization. I just occasionally rely on them. And like, I'm sure his editors love being referred to in that kind of way. Vorsch even has a chance to go into this a lot more on his own channel, which he does. He made a video recapping and providing some commentary on the debate. But all he does is really whine about being called a hypocrite by Molyneux. He doesn't um, develop his view any further or defend himself any better. I don't. I, I honestly don't think he feels the need. So let's lay it out. So he. he I would say he definitely is a hypocrite. I, I, by which I mean the things he says he believes, he doesn't act like he believes. If he really thought the co-ops were ethically and financially better ways to run your business, then he would do that. So why isn't he? The obvious answer seems to be that he doesn't have the courage of his convictions and that he, he's either, he either knows his view is false, like he's just a total cynic. He knows that co-ops don't work and that's why he's not doing it. Or there's just some cognitive dissonance going on where he, he, he really does think the view's a good one, but he really does think it's not a good way to run his channel specifically. And obviously that just looks like special pleading, right? That just looks like Vorch saying, well, everyone else should run their business like a co-op, but not maybe not small YouTubers for some reason. The, the the spirit of what he's been arguing for and the spirit of co-ops, that it allows people to escape drudgery and drudge-like works and lets them um, let their minds soar like Einstein's, right? He uses that as an analogy at points. You know, you should take people out of factory work and farm work so they can work on their own talents and habits. Like, well, if you had a person that was regularly employed, presumably they'd be able to do that better. So the, the, the spirit of his argument goes against the way he acts for sure. So I would say he is a hypocrite. But the, the, the big question is, does that matter? And does it really harm his view? Or does it just harm Vorsch's reputation and his brand? There is a, a risk here that, and I think Vorsch is, I don't think he says it directly, but he's, he's kind of, the, I think this is what the point Vorsch thinks he's getting to is that calling someone a hypocrite is just ad hominem. You're not attacking their views. You're just saying, well, you are a hypocrite. So should that really matter to the idea of whether or not co-ops are a good way to run a business? Well, in this case, there's definitely smoke. I don't know if there's fire. So the problem Vorsch has specifically is that he is advocating a practical position. He is saying people um, who run businesses should make those businesses co-ops. And here's the reasons for that. It's more ethical. It's more financially viable, blah, blah, blah. In short, his, his, his position isn't pure theory, it has a practical dimension, and we know for a fact Vorsch isn't living up to that practical dimension, right? We know that he's not running his business like a co-op. So that would seem to hurt the theory, like, does Vorsch know on some level that his channel wouldn't be as successful if he ran, if he ran it like a co-op? That's what Molyneux wants to get at. This would be a huge win, a home run for Molyneux, if he could make Vorsch say something like, um, you're right, I, I don't run my channel like a co-op because I wouldn't be as successful, right? Obviously, Vorsch is never going to do that. But what Vorsch could just do is something like just bite the bullet and say, well, you're right, I am a hypocrite, but there's nothing wrong with the theory. The theory is a perfectly good theory. I just don't live up to it for whatever personal failings I have. But Vorsch isn't going to do that either <laughs> because he has a reputation and a brand and an ego and he, he doesn't want to admit to being a hypocrite, right? Even when he's, he's caught in the act, essentially. Vorsch continues to make really weak defences throughout this argument and throughout his analysis. He, he keeps saying, I've never heard anyone say that YouTubers should run their channels like that. It's like, well, now you have. More than you suggested it. So what do you make of it? He, he just acts like, well, this idea has never been proposed before and therefore must be a bad one. It's a very strange move. Very weak argumentation. The absolute knockout blow optically, not in terms of argumentation, comes when Molyneux starts to tell Vorsch, hey, I've had experiences running businesses. If you'd like me to help you run your channel like a co-op, that can be arranged. That That's the funniest thing I've ever seen said in a debate. I mean, I, again, that's not like, that's not an argumentative knockout. He hasn't won the argument there, but like optically, that is so funny. It's so hard to be on Borsch's side after that. More than you has like said to him, 
I will help you put your ideas into practice since you're not willing to yourself. So again, he, it's, it's not the end of the debate. He hasn't pressured Vorsch to the point where Vorsch has to give up. Vorsch's defences are awful. But optically speaking, this is just a, a, a brilliant win. Vorsch is just... Vorsch can't get it anywhere here. And, it, and it's notable that this is completely different to Section 1, where they spent all their time arguing about uh, Molyneux's view. This time it's all Molyneux attacking Vorsch, but not even really attacking his view, just attacking him for being a hypocrite. Molyneux hasn't even really provided an answer in this section, so all we do is talk about Vorsch. And even though that worked really well for Molyneux in Part 1, because he was able to refine and develop his ideas, possibly on the fly, Vorsch cannot do that. And even when he's had a month to think about it, and he put out his analysis video, he still hasn't come up with a good defense. So he, he just, he flounders and he looks ridiculous and he can't get anywhere here. Watching the Vorsch analysis, and again, links down below, is, is really interesting, not from an argumentative perspective, because he's really bad at analyzing arguments. Like the gulf between him and Molyneux, Molyneux gives like, even if you don't like Molyneux or what he's saying, he, he sits down with headphones, he analyzes the debate, he says, here's the argumentative move I made here, um, here's some more information. Here's how I could refine that. Vorsch just whines about being called a hypocrite. Very weak. But his arguments reach like, it's it's like inception of hypocrisy. Because he doesn't think that calling someone a hypocrite is a real argument. I assume he means it's an ad hom and you're not attacking their views, you're attacking them personally. Then he says at one point, the, the, the greatest line I think I've ever heard uh, in debate analysis, which is saying something. He says that if you call him, Vorsch, a hypocrite, then, quote, you are a moron who is not making an argument, end quote. Marvellous. You're a moron that's not making an argument, he argued. Like, it's so, it's so terrible that Vorsch doesn't realise he's not making an argument back. It's, it's just, they call you a hypocrite, so you call them a moron. But you haven't explained why it's bad to call them a hypocrite. And like I say, Molyneux could have struck gold. As it was, he didn't finish him off in a, like a, a logical sense. He didn't prove his view to be wrong, but he made him look really silly. And I bet everyone at the end of that debate is thinking, well, maybe Vorsch doesn't put his ideas into practice because he knows they don't work, because the theory is a bad theory. The only other thing I wanted to discuss before I announced the overall winner was just a note on the moderation and setup. So the moderation I thought was really good. Uh, the moderator didn't get involved, but they didn't really need to. Um, some debates, like I've seen a Vorsch for Sargon before, where it's like, please, this needs some moderation. Someone needs to step in and, and like guide these guys back to some sort of sensible discussion. In this one, the moderator just asked the questions, um, asked them to summarize at the end of each section, uh, which I thought was really nice, and nothing ended up getting out of hand. So top marks to the moderator. I want to point that out because moderators are kind of like referees if they do a good job. No one really notices or thanks them for it, so I thought they did well there. So then let's wrap it up with the scores. As I say, I don't think anyone gets points for argumentation here at all. Zero, zero. Molyneux didn't provide an answer. Vorsch did, but we didn't really talk about it much, and then he looked like he was contradicting himself anyway. Uh, on optics, I'd say 8-2. Like, Molyneux's 8 out of 10, Vorsch is 2 out of 10. Um, I, like, if, if he'd been able to force Vorsch to admit that he was a hypocrite or admit the theory was wrong, then it'd be like 10 nil, right? But as it was, I mean, Molyneux really wound him up and optically wiped the floor with him. Like I said in the last video, I, I do wonder if he's a fan of the channel. I actually, Molyneux's own analysis, I would have really liked to see more of him explaining how he argues and how he debates. Because he says at one point, quite explicitly, that him talking about magical people that know how to produce wealth he describes that in the analysis as a trap, which I thought it might be. I think he knows what he's doing. I think the hope was Vorsch would go, magical people, what the hell are you talking about? And then Molyneux would give him a side eye and say, I, I'll have to explain to you what a metaphor is, and Vorsch would end up looking silly. I think that was the trap, to put out something that looked obviously silly, but wasn't actually that important, which is the metaphor that Vorsch would go for. And although Vorsch definitely got a bee in his bonnet about the magical people thing, like he, he scoffingly mentions it a few times in his analysis, um, he, he doesn't bite, he doesn't go after that, he does attack the substance of the argument, so the trap didn't quite work. But I wonder how many other little little traps and little uh, tactics Molyneux worked into that debate that I didn't notice. So yeah, given the two sections, a win for Molyneux overall, a, a, a good argumentative win in the first half, and then a, a, an optical thrashing with no argumentation in the second half. Molyneux is the overall winner, 
And of course, I haven't say stuff like this, but this is not an endorsement of any white nationalist views that he might have. None of that came up during the debate. It's not relevant here. I don't endorse white nationalism. Um, on new wins. Analyzing section two here was kind of like analyzing the presidential debates, which I tried to do for this channel, but I just had to give up on because they were too ridiculous. Um, when I say I'm giving Molyneux the optics win, it's kind of like if two people turn up to have a race and then one of the people just turns around and punches the other guy in the face and then just beats him to the ground and beats him up and then stands up and goes, yay, I won the race. And it's like, well, you didn't. You, you won the fight, you, you, but you didn't even have the race. That's what it's like. Molyneux kind of threw the debate out the window and set up a new thing and then won at doing that. So uh, good for him. So I hope you all enjoyed this video. I hope you all watch uh, both parts to get the full picture. And thank you again very much to David Box for suggesting this analysis. If any of you have any other debates you'd like me to analyze, uh, the channel might start doing that more often here since the first debate analysis I did got way more views and ultimately that is important to me. Um, so if you have anything you'd like me to analyze, you know, recent, any sort of topic, uh, I'd love to pick it apart. Until next time, thank you very much for watching. Leave a like for the video if you like it. Share it with your friends if you think they'd like it and subscribe to the channel. There might be a bell below. Lots of YouTubers have started saying there is. I can't really see one on, on my YouTube whenever I log on. If there is a bell, please click that bell. That apparently helps. Uh, thank you very much and have a good one. See you soon. Bye.